Many Christians read the New Testament with the inherited assumption that Jesus opposed Judaism and came to replace it with his brand new religion of Christianity. In Pastor Andy Stanley's book, Irresistible, he puts it this way. He says, Jesus was new wine. Judaism and paganism were old wineskins. The new Jesus offered a departure from the traditions of both. He goes on to say, As long as we cling to the old Jesus came to replace, we will never fully appreciate, experience, or even recognize the new he came to put in place. I hope you'll be ready to unhitch your faith, your theology, and your lifestyle once and for all from the old that Jesus came to replace. Jesus fulfilled as an ended the necessity of the Jewish law. In fulfilling it, he made it obsolete. First, I want to say that after reading Pastor Stanley's book, I appreciate that he is addressing an issue that many Christians are confused about, and that is how they relate to the Torah. I think he's right that Christians, Gentile followers of Jesus, are not responsible to observe Shabbat, maintain a kosher diet, celebrate the Jewish festivals, and so on. And on this channel, we will devote much of our content in support of that conclusion. But one of my primary problems with Pastor Stanley's book and the statements I just quoted is that holding the position that Gentiles do not need to observe the whole Torah does not require you to also hold the position that Jesus came to replace Judaism or make the Torah obsolete. By arguing these points, Stanley eliminates Messianic Jews and Messianic Judaism. Because Messianic Judaism is Jesus-centered Judaism, which teaches that Jewish followers of Jesus have a covenantal responsibility to live a Jewish life, observing the Torah's commandments and maintaining Israel's unique identity within the body of Messiah. If Pastor Stanley is right, Jesus opposes Messianic Judaism, and Messianic Jews should become Christians. In essence, Jews like myself should give up our Judaism. The idea that Jesus located himself outside and against his Jewish heritage was actually the dominant view in historical Jesus scholarship, but this is no longer the case. Developments in the study of Second Temple Judaism, along with post-Holocaust theology, has caused a paradigm shift in scholarship, to the point that today, virtually all scholars in Jesus research view Jesus and his message as belonging within Second Temple Judaism, not opposed to it. And in this video, I want to share with you why I think these scholars are spot on. So let's get into this. First, we need to ask a foundational question. What did Judaism mean during the time of Jesus? In Greek, the word often translated as Judaism is Eudaismos, and the earliest example of this word is in 2 Maccabees 2, which was probably written between 143 and 142 BCE, and it's known for calling Jews to celebrate Hanukkah. It was during Antiochus IV's reign where he outlawed Jewish practice under gruesome penalty. He defiled the Jerusalem temple, among many other terrible things. And in 2 Maccabees 2, verse 21 through 22, the author says that Judas Maccabeus and his brothers fought bravely for Judaism, so that though few in number, they regained possession of the temple, famous throughout the world, and liberated the city, and reestablished the laws that were about to be abolished, while the Lord with great kindness became gracious to them. Judas Maccabeus and his brothers fought for their Jewish way of life, which the author of 2 Maccabees calls Judaism. So, we can understand Judaism as the ways of the Jews in contrast to the ways of the nations. During the Second Temple period, Jews engaged in unique practices such as worshiping the God of Israel in the Jerusalem Temple through sacrifice, offering prayers to God in the Temple, in their homes, in their synagogues, studying the Torah and other Jewish scriptural texts. They circumcised their Jewish boys on the eighth day. They refrained from work on Shabbat. They celebrated Jewish festivals. They maintained a kosher diet. These were all unique practices of the Jews. And I think that one of the fundamental problems with the idea that Jesus opposed Judaism is that it presumes that there was only one form of Judaism. However, Judaism was not, nor has it ever been, monolithic, especially during this period. I love how Jewish New Testament scholar Dr. Amy Jalavine says it. Judaism is remarkably diverse. 
Um, and there's no head Jew to tell Jews what to do. And you know what? If there were, we wouldn't listen anyway. What scholars call Second Temple Judaism describes the variety of Judaisms that existed between the rebuilding of the Jerusalem Temple in 516 BCE and its destruction in 70 CE. During this time, there were many Judaisms, and these various Jewish groups had disagreements on the afterlife, resurrection, Sabbath observance, purity laws, the coming of the Messiah or Messiahs, the efficacy of the temple sacrifices, the traditions of the fathers, among other areas of Jewish belief and practices. There were many Jewish groups during the Second Temple period, such as the Pharisees, Sadducees, Qumranites, Enoch groups, immersion groups, and so on. Compounding this effect, most Jews were not formal members of any one of these groups. And this historical context is crucial because many people think that the Pharisees are the representatives of Judaism, as if there was one Judaism. But that's just not true. Jewish groups sharply disagree with each other. Even Pharisees argued with other Pharisees, which means that any disagreement Jesus has with a Jew or a Jewish group, that does not automatically make him an opponent of Judaism at large or the inventor of a brand new religion. Instead, these are examples of Jesus participating in debates with fellow Jews within Judaism. As Dr. Baccaccini says, being Jewish in the first century did not mean to conform to a monolithic model, but to engage in a common debate where categories inherited from the past were creatively played and continuously given new, sometimes unexpected developments. Here's my argument. Jesus situates himself within Second Temple Judaism by the way he teaches, lives, and debates. So let me explain. In Mark 12, a group of Sadducees come to Jesus and present an objection against his view that God will raise the dead. The Sadducees disagreed with Jesus, the Pharisees, and probably most other Jews about whether God will raise the dead. One of the Pharisees recognizes that Jesus gave a solid response to the Sadducees' objection and decides to ask Jesus the following question, which commandment is the most important of all? This is a good Jewish question, and Jesus responds, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. First, I want to emphasize what Jesus is not doing. Jesus is not replacing all the Torah's commandments into the command to love God and to love your neighbor. That's not what he's doing. Jesus begins his response by reciting the Shema, Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And this is significant because in its original context, the Shema is an oath of covenantal allegiance to the God of Israel alone and a pledge of commitment to obey the Torah. And I'll revisit a few points that Eric made in his video, The Shema's Impact on the Gospel and Replacement Theology, which I'll link in the description below. The first time the phrase Shema Yisrael, Hero Israel, appears in the Torah is found in Deuteronomy 5 verse 1, the chapter directly preceding the Shema in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. And this verse functions as the beginning of Moses' representation of the Ten Commandments. In Deuteronomy 5 verse 1, Moses says, Hear, O Israel, the laws and rules that I proclaim to you this day. Study them and observe them faithfully. The hero Israel of Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 is directly connected to the hero Israel of the giving of the Torah and the Ten Commandments. The immediate context of Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 supports this. Deuteronomy 6 verse 1 through 3 reads, And this is the instruction, the laws and the rules that the Lord your God has commanded me to impart to you, to be observed in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy, so that you, your children, and your children's children may revere the Lord your God and follow as long as you live all his laws and commandments that I join upon you to the end that you may long endure. Obey, O Israel, willingly and faithfully, that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, spoke to you. 
The instruction to obey the Torah's commandments is repeatedly emphasized in these three verses leading up to the Shema in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. The JPS version even translates Shema in verse 3 as to obey because in biblical Hebrew, there's no word that simply means to obey. Shema is one of the best words available to convey this verb. And following the Shema, Deuteronomy 6 verse 5 through 6 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Take to heart these instructions which I charge you this day. To declare, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, is a pledge to worship the God of Israel alone and to remain faithful to his commandments. Orthodox Jewish scholar Dr. Michael Vishagrad says this, Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 is, as we have seen, a declaration that only God is to be worshipped, coupled with the conviction that the proper worship of God consists of obeying his commandments as set forth in the Ten Commandments and in the Torah as a whole. Going back to Mark 12, the scribe asks Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus begins his response with, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Given the meaning of the Shema in its original context, we can infer that he is not about to replace the entire Torah with the double command to love God and love your neighbor. Because the Shema was already a pledge to worship and love God alone and to obey the whole Torah which includes loving one's neighbor. Then Jesus provides the commandments that he thinks are the greatest of all. He says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. This is a brilliant answer. Jesus expresses the heart of the Torah through Deuteronomy 6 verse 5 and Leviticus 19 verse 18. And the way he teaches here is similar to how other Jews taught. His combination of two biblical texts is an example of the Jewish interpretive principle called Gizra Shva, which literally means an equivalent regulation. Deuteronomy 6 verse 5 and Leviticus 19 verse 18 share the phrase Vahafta and you shall love. And so Jesus links these two commandments because of their shared phrase. And we actually see similar perspectives from other ancient Jews during the first century BCE. For example, the Testament of Dan 5.3 says this, Love the Lord with all your life and each other with a true heart. The Testament of Issachar chapter 5 verse 1 through 2 says, So keep the Torah of God, my children, and acquire simplicity, walking without guile and not interfering with the commandments of the Lord or with the affairs of your neighbor. But love the Lord and your neighbor, show mercy to the poor and the weak. In later rabbinic literature, we find something similar. The Jerusalem Talmud records Rabbi Akiva saying, Love your neighbor as yourself. This is a major principle of the Torah. In the Babylonian Talmud, Shabbat 31a, a Gentile seeking to convert to Judaism asks Rabbi Hillel to teach him the entire Torah. And this is what Rabbi Hillel says, What is hateful to you, do not to your fellow. All the rest is commentary. Go and learn. And so the late Orthodox Jewish scholar, Dr. David Flusser, he says this, Both Jesus and Hillel before him saw the golden rule as a summary of the law of Moses. This becomes intelligible when we consider that the biblical saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, Leviticus 19 verse 18, was esteemed by Jesus and by the Jews in general as a chief commandment of the law. Jesus' way of expressing the heart of the Torah with the commandments to love God and your neighbor was not innovative, but it is Jewish. He demonstrates his commitment to obey the Torah's commandments not only through his use of the Shema and Leviticus 19 verse 18, but also how he dressed. In Matthew 9, while Jesus is traveling to raise Jairus' daughter from the dead, verse 20 says, And behold, a woman who suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. The Greek word translated as fringe is kraspedu, which is the same word the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Tanakh, uses to render the Hebrew word tzitzit, found in Numbers 15, verse 38 through 39. Jesus wore tzitzit, the fringes that Pharisees and other observant Jewish men wore, as a physical reminder to keep the Torah's commandments. 
In Matthew 23, verse 5, Jesus says, The Pharisees and scribes do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. Notice Jesus is not criticizing the Pharisees for simply wearing tzitzit and tefillin. He is criticizing the reason these particular Pharisees are wearing them. Instead of wearing them to honor God, they wear them to honor themselves. And as Jewish scholar Dr. Amy Gillivine comments, the text suggests that Jesus' phylacteries were narrow and his fringes shorter. Jesus thus does not dismiss the Torah. In the modern idiom, he wears it on his sleeve. The role Jewish tradition functions in Jesus' life also situates him within Second Temple Judaism. I know Pastor Stanley says, Jesus was new wine, Judaism and paganism were old wineskins, the new Jesus offered a departure from the traditions of both. But this is demonstrably false, because the Gospels record Jesus keeping Jewish traditions. Jesus sets the example for his Jewish disciples by attending the synagogue on Shabbat, celebrating the Passover meal with wine as a central feature, offering prayers over the bread and wine during the Passover meal, wearing tefillin, and celebrating Hanukkah, among other things. So, these examples demonstrate that Jesus did not offer a departure from Jewish tradition because Jewish tradition was a major part of how Jesus lived. Jesus also situates himself within Second Temple Judaism by the way he debates with Pharisees about what is lawful on the Sabbath. I even think the fact that Jesus has the debates demonstrates his commitment to the Torah and Judaism. So, let's dig into an example. In Matthew 12, a man with a withered hand enters the synagogue Jesus is attending on Shabbat. And side note, Jesus is attending the synagogue because as a Torah observant Jew, it was his custom to worship in the synagogue on Shabbat. And so while he's there, a group of Pharisees ask him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And Matthew informs us that they're asking this question so that they might accuse him. And this is how Jesus responds. Which one of you has a sheep? if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand, and the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. Jesus is engaging these Pharisees in a halakhic debate on whether it is lawful to heal this man's withered hand on the Sabbath. And also to clarify, halakha is basically a way of applying the Torah's commandments. So before jumping to the conclusion that Jesus was opposing Judaism, let's keep a few things in mind. In the Torah, the commandments explaining what constitutes as work that is prohibited on Shabbat are not exhaustive, so Jews debated these issues. The Pharisees do not represent the views of all Jews and Judaism. Even Pharisees disagree with other Pharisees about what was lawful on the Sabbath. And of the many different Judaisms during the first century, most Jews did not belong to any particular Jewish group or sect. And according to Dr. Craig Keener, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes only made up about 0.5% of the Jewish population in Israel. Jewish scholar Dr. Isaac Oliver says, To be sure, many common Jews would probably have ignored the injunctions of rabbis, Essenes, Pharisees, and the like, and probably cared for the sick on the Sabbath at their own discretion. So it's not like all Jews agreed with the Pharisees' understanding of how to observe the Torah, how to keep the Sabbath. In Matthew 12, Jesus' disagreement with these particular Pharisees on healing the man with the withered hand on Shabbat, this does not make him opponent of Judaism. It makes him a participant within the Second Temple Jewish conversation of what is lawful on the Sabbath. For example, in the Damascus document, which is a text from the Dead Sea Scrolls, it contains the following ruling. Let no man deliver the offspring of an animal on the Sabbath day, and if it falls into a pit or a ditch, let him not raise it on the Sabbath. Matthew 12 verse 11 indicates that the Pharisees disagreed with this ruling and were willing to lift a sheep that fell into a ditch on the Sabbath. And we know this because Jesus appeals to their shared conviction when he says, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? Here Jesus uses a kal vechomer, lesser to the greater rabbinic argument. 
where he says, basically, if these Pharisees are willing to lift a sheep that has fallen into a pit on the Sabbath, then how much more should Jesus be able to heal this man who is even more valuable than a sheep? And you might be asking, why is Jesus and the Pharisees even having this argument? Like, what's the point? Let me explain by quoting from the Mishnah Yoma 8.6 to help give some context to this issue. The rabbis say, in the case of one who is seized with a life-threatening illness, causing him unbearable hunger pangs and impaired vision, one may feed him even impure foods on Yom Kippur or any other day until his eyes recover, as the return of his sight indicates that he is recovering. A case of uncertainty concerning a life-threatening situation overrides Shabbat. The idea here is that the rabbis considered giving someone medical treatment a form of work which was forbidden on the Sabbath, but if someone's life was in danger, working to heal them was justified. Sometimes one has to break a lesser commandment in order to keep the greater commandment, and in this case, breaking kosher and the Yom Kippur fast may be necessary to keep the greater command of preserving life. And this concept was also present amongst Jews during the Second Temple period. During the Hasmonean Wars, Jewish soldiers decided that although they considered fighting as a work prohibited on the Sabbath, they fought anyway because of the value of preserving life. In Matthew 12 verse 5, Jesus points out an example where the Torah itself requires work on the Sabbath. He says, Have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? Dr. Karen Zetterholm explains this Jewish principle attested both in Second Temple and Rabbinic texts in the following way. If a specific law is understood to violate the moral principles of the Torah, it may be necessary in certain circumstances to suspend that particular law in order to preserve and safeguard the Torah. In Matthew 12, Jesus understands the objection these Pharisees are raising quite well. Healing a non-life-threatening illness on the Sabbath, according to their Pharisaic halakha, is a form of work and thus violates Shabbat. In Matthew 12, verse 7, Jesus presents his central operating principle for determining what should be done or not done on the Sabbath. He quotes from Hosea 6, verse 6, which says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. This relates to what he says is the greatest double commandment in the Torah, to love God and love your neighbor, from Deuteronomy 6, verse 5 and Leviticus 19, verse 18. Jesus safeguards the Torah through his central operating principle. If the way one chooses to observe Shabbat prevents one from loving God or their neighbor, they should disregard that halakhic option. And as I discussed earlier, other Jews, including the later rabbis, employed a similar principle. To further understand how Jesus' view of Sabbath observance fits within Second Temple Judaism, I think Jesus' statement in Mark 2 verse 27 is key. He says, The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. Here, Jesus says the very purpose God created the Sabbath, and it coincides with a Jewish perspective we find throughout Jewish history. There's a great rabbinic midrash in Makilta on Exodus 31 verse 13 that is a fantastic parallel to Jesus' statement in Mark 2 verse 27. This is where Rabbi Shimon says, The Sabbath is given unto you, not you unto the Sabbath. Let that sink in. I love how Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel describes Shabbat. In his book, The Sabbath, which I highly recommend, Rabbi Heschel says this, To observe the Sabbath is to celebrate the coronation of a day in the spiritual wonderland of time, the air of which we inhale when we call it a delight. Call the Sabbath a delight, a delight to the soul, and a delight to the body. The idea that the Sabbath is a day of delight comes from Isaiah 58 verse 13. And understanding Shabbat as a joyous day is implicit in the prohibition of fasting on Shabbat in Second Temple and later rabbinic texts. The first century Jewish philosopher Philo calls the Sabbath a symbol of gladness of soul and of thankfulness to God. Dr. Matthew Thiessen makes the following connection that I think is crucial for understanding Jesus' healing on the Sabbath. He says, according to Peskita Rabati 23 verse 8, an angel of God calls people out of Sheol so they can delight in the Sabbath. Any work that takes away from the joy of the Sabbath must be prohibited work. 
Thiessen cites examples from the Gospels on this principle. He says how the women go to anoint Jesus' corpse after Shabbat is ended because one of the reasons for waiting could very well be that this is not a joyous act. In Matthew 24, verse 40, Jesus says to pray that the day of tribulation does not happen on Shabbat, and this is likely because it does not bring joy to flee for your life on Shabbat. According to Tosefta, Shabbat 16, verse 22, the house of Shammai did not visit the sick on Shabbat because that would be taking away from the celebration of the day. Tyson reasons from these examples, Jesus' actions of healing illnesses are distinctly dissimilar to visiting the sick precisely because the deeds Jesus performs actually increase joy. He does not merely visit the sick. Rather, he heals and restores them, making them whole again. He has moved them from the realm of death to the realm of life. Before concluding my response to Jesus' healing on the Sabbath, I want to play a clip from counter-missionary Rabbi Michael Skoback, who I think makes a great point concerning the Sabbath dispute with the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12. But the, the point I want to make here, and this is the, gets down to the bottom of the story, is how do you do the healing? How is the healing done? I mean that if you're doing the healing, let's say by lighting a fire to make a boil water, then you're mm. actually doing something which is prohibited on the Sabbath. But that's not how Jesus healed. Jesus healed um, by saying words or by laying hands. And the reality is that there's absolutely nothing wrong with healing by reciting a prayer or saying words or touching someone at all. It's not malachi. It's, it's nothing. There's nothing right. wrong with 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 what Jesus would have been doing. So, you know, the, the, it's a strange story because they're asking him, is it okay to heal on the Sabbath? Because they, they heard that he was healing people and they wanted him to say, no, there's no problem with that. And they would have said, gotcha. But they didn't got you because right. what he was doing was not prohibited, even according to what the rabbis taught. Rabbi Skobek is a counter missionary whose goal is to stop Jews from becoming Messianic Jews. But I love that I can learn from him on this point. He's right. Even according to the Talmud, Jesus does not violate the Sabbath when he heals the man with the withered hand. Orthodox Jewish scholar Dr. David Flusser says, Healing by word was always permitted on the Sabbath. Praying for God to heal people on Shabbat is practiced to this day in the form of the Misha Berach prayer, which is uttered in synagogues around the world. To summarize, when Jesus argues with Pharisees in Matthew 12, verse 10 through 13, concerning healing on the Sabbath, he never says Sabbath observance is obsolete. Instead, he uses a lesser to the greater rabbinic argument to show that if these Pharisees are willing to lift a sheep from a pit on Shabbat, they should welcome him to heal the man suffering from a withered hand on Shabbat. This reasoning flows from his central operating principle of mercy, loving God, and one's neighbor must be observed at the expense of maintaining this particular Pharisaic halakha. Jesus allows this man to fully enjoy the Sabbath by healing him, and even by the standards of later rabbis, Jesus does not actually do anything that would constitute work on the Sabbath. Jesus is not opposing Judaism by arguing with these Pharisees. He is engaging in an intra-Jewish debate using the kinds of hermeneutical methods of interpretation that these Pharisees and later rabbis would find legitimate. He is presenting his own case for the core values of Judaism. Someone might say, okay, but Judaism was a legalistic works righteousness religion. Jews believed that they could earn their salvation by following the Old Testament laws. But Jesus brought a brand new religion of salvation through God's grace, not works. Martin Luther is famous for characterizing ancient Judaism in this way. And even today, many Christians hold this same assumption. Pastor Andy Stanley reinforces this perspective when he writes in his book, Irresistible. While Jewish Christians in Paul's day viewed a blend of ancient tradition with new revelation as harmless, Paul saw something different. He knew the legalism, hypocrisy, self-righteousness, and exclusivity that characterized ancient Judaism would eventually seep into and erode the beauty, simplicity, and appeal of the ecclesia of Jesus. The view that Second Temple Judaism was a legalistic religion of works righteousness dominated New Testament scholarship until the publication of Dr. E. P. Sanders' book, Paul and Palestinian Judaism, which came out in 1977. And this book caused a paradigm shift in New Testament scholarship. 
Through his study of ancient Jewish literature, both during the Second Temple period and the later rabbis, Sanders argues that Luther's view of ancient Jews and Judaism is historically inaccurate. According to Sanders, most ancient Jewish sources assume what he calls covenantal gnomism. That is, Jews obey the Torah's commandments not because they think they can earn their salvation. Instead, they obey the commandments as a faithful response to God's mercy. God graciously chose Israel, and following the Torah was their covenantal responsibility. Torah observance maintains their membership in God's covenant that he established with Israel long ago. Essentially, Sanders argues that most Jews during this time affirmed that salvation comes solely from God, not human achievement. Of course, Sanders' work has not gone unchallenged, and we will devote a future video addressing the topic, Was Second Temple Judaism Legalistic? But for now, I want to read you some ancient texts that Sanders cites as evidence that many Jews held the conviction that they are saved by God's grace, not by their obedience to the commandments. So here's a couple examples from the Dead Sea Scrolls. 1QH 4.29-33 says the following, Righteousness, I know, is not of man, nor is perfection of way of the Son of Man. To the Most High God belong all righteous deeds. The way of man is not established except by the Spirit which God created for him, to make perfect a way for the children of men, that all his creatures might know the might of his power and the abundance of his mercies towards all the sons of his grace. 1QS 11.12 says this, as for me, if I stumble, the mercies of God shall be my eternal salvation. If I stagger because of the sin of flesh, my justification shall be the righteousness of God, which endures forever. In Antiquities of the Jews, the first century historian Josephus rewrites much of what is found in the Tanakh. And in Book 4, 2.12-2.13, he rewrites a portion of Moses' words from Deuteronomy. He says, Let all acknowledge before God the bounties which he has bestowed on them through their deliverance from the land of Egypt. Thanksgiving is a natural duty and is rendered alike in gratitude for past mercies and to incline the giver to others yet to come. They shall inscribe also on their doors the greatest of the benefits which they have received from God, and each shall display them on his arms. And all that can show forth the power of God and his goodwill toward them, let them bear a record thereof written on the head and on the arm, so that men may see on every side the loving care with which God surrounds them. Many Jews during the first century, like today, observed the commandments described in Deuteronomy 6, verse 8-9 through 9, by wearing tefillin and placing mezuzot on their door frames. In this text, Josephus depicts Moses saying that Jewish people observe these commandments not to earn salvation, but as a way of attesting to God's loving care that surrounds them. The commandments are observed as a response to God's grace and mercy, which is a view that the Torah itself expresses. In the same chapter as the Shema, Deuteronomy 6 verse 20-25, through 25, is Moses telling Israel why they should follow the Torah's commandments. This is what it says. When your children ask you, in time to come, what is the meaning of the decrees and the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your children, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. The Lord displayed before our eyes great and awesome signs and wonders against Egypt, against Pharaoh and all his household. He brought us out from there in order to bring us in, to give us the land that he promised an oath to our ancestors. Then the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our lasting good, so as to keep us alive, as is now the case. If we diligently observe this entire commandment before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, we will be in the right. Like Josephus, the Torah teaches that Israel should obey the commandments in response to God saving us from slavery in Egypt. It is God's grace towards us that should evoke our commitment to obey his commandments. These Jewish sources demonstrate that characterizing ancient Judaism as a legalistic religion of works righteousness is wrong. I'm sure there were some Jews who obeyed the Torah for the wrong reasons, but the evidence indicates that many ancient Jews understood they are not saved by their own righteous deeds, but by God's grace. We see the proclamation of God's grace even in our liturgy. Listen to the opening blessing before the morning Shema. You have loved us with great love, 
Lord our God, and with surpassing compassion have you had compassion on us, our Father, our King, for the sake of our ancestors who trusted in you, and to whom you taught the laws of life. Be gracious also to us, and teach us. Our Father, compassionate Father, ever compassionate, have compassion on us. Instill in our hearts the desire to understand and discern, to listen, learn, and teach, and to observe, perform, and fulfill all the teachings of your Torah in love. Enlighten our eyes in your Torah, and let our hearts cling to your commandments. Unite our hearts to love and revere your name, so that we may never be ashamed. And because we have trusted in your holy, great, and revered name, may we be glad and rejoice in your salvation. The Torah is not a burden, it's a gracious gift, and God's grace is further expressed in the Amidah prayer when we pray, Forgive us, our Father, for we have sinned. Pardon us, our King, for we have willfully transgressed. For you pardon and forgive. Blessed are you, O Lord, who is gracious and ever willing to forgive. Dr. Helen Bond is exactly right when she says, No longer can scholars imagine a normative, monolithic Judaism of works righteousness against which Jesus stood out. Now let's look at one final text from Matthew's Gospel that I think further demonstrates that Jesus did not oppose Judaism. In Matthew 5.17, Jesus says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. It's amazing because not only does the way Jesus teach, live, and debate situate him within Second Temple Judaism, but I think Matthew 5.17 is his emphatic statement that he did not come to oppose Judaism. But before I explain why, I want to address a common Christian interpretation of Matthew 5.17 that I think Pastor Andy Stanley precisely states. He says, Jesus did not come to abolish, as in destroy, the validity of, or undermine the credibility of the law. Jesus came to bring it to a designated end. In fulfilling the law, he made it obsolete. I understand why Pastor Stanley and many Christians think this way. There's a long interpretive history that reads Jesus over and against Judaism, which is a faulty assumption to begin with. But let's read Pastor Stanley's case. The Greek term translated fulfill is used by both Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount as well as Luke in his recitation of Jesus' synagogue message. In both instances, the term means to bring to a designated end. If the law were a homework assignment, he was completing it. If the law were a speech, he was concluding it. If the law were a plane, he was landing it. This was his way of saying God's conditional, temporary covenant with Israel was coming to an end the intended from the beginning end. When God established his covenant with Israel, he set a timer. According to Jesus, the time had run out. He goes on to explain what Jesus means by fulfill through an analogy. He says, if you had an overwhelming amount of debt that you wanted to rid yourself of, one option would be to declare bankruptcy. In that case, your obligation would not be fulfilled, just removed. But if someone came along and paid off your debt, the obligation would be fulfilled and the burden of fulfilling that obligation would be removed as well. Jesus fulfilled as an ended the necessity of the Jewish law. Just as you don't abolish a home by completing its construction, Jesus did not abolish the law when he fulfilled it, but in fulfilling it, he made it obsolete. There's a lot there. But essentially, Stanley cites a Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament, also known as BDAG, as evidence that in Matthew 5.17, fulfill, the Greek word plerao, means to bring to a designated end, as in make the Torah obsolete. BDAG is an excellent Greek lexicon that has been described as, without doubt, the best tool of its kind that exists in any language. But Stanley's argument doesn't work. Because the specific meaning of plerao that Stanley cites from BDAG actually contradicts his thesis. BDAG has six definitions and multiple sub-definitions describing the possible meanings of plerao. Matthew 5.17 is listed under definition number four, which is to bring to a designed end, fulfill. And notice it says designed end, not even Stanley's designated end. But you shouldn't stop there when using a lexicon. Notice the note about Matthew 5.17 specifically. BDAG says, Depending on how one prefers to interpret the context, plerao is understood here either as fulfill 
do, carry out, or as to bring to full expression, show it forth in its true meaning, or as fill up, complete. In none of these definitions does plerao mean to make obsolete. That's not what it says. When you read Matthew 5.17 with the various meanings BDAG provides here, there is no indication that this was Jesus' way of saying God was ending his covenant with Israel. A close reading of Matthew 5.17 in its Jewish context indicates that Jesus is saying the opposite of what Stanley is proposing. The Hebrew equivalent of the Greek word plerao is lekayim, from the root kum, which means establish, to confirm, to stand up. This word is found in Mishnah Perkei Avot 4.9, and this text says, Rabbi Jonathan said, Whoever fulfills the Torah out of a state of poverty, his end will be to fulfill it out of a state of wealth. Whoever discards the Torah out of a state of wealth, his end will be to discard it out of a state of poverty. The same root kum is found in Deuteronomy 27 verse 26. Accursed is one who will not uphold the words of this Torah to perform them. Keeping this in mind, Dr. Nicholas Shazer explains that when Jesus says he is fulfilling the Torah, he is establishing it, doing it rightly. And this makes sense because as I explained in this video, Jesus lives this out through his observance of the commandments, understanding that right halakha must prioritize loving God and loving one's neighbor. This reading also corresponds well with the Greek. Bdag lists the meaning of plerao in Matthew 5.17 with the following definitions. Fulfill, as in do, carry out, or as bring to full expression. Show it forth in its true meaning, or as fill up, complete. I think Dr. Craig Keener is right when he says, To fulfill God's law was to confirm it by obedience and demonstrating that one's teaching accorded with it. When we keep in mind Jesus' commentary on various commandments in the Torah in Matthew 5-7 through 7, and throughout his teachings, I think my friend Ben, a graduate student in rabbinic studies, articulates the meaning of Jesus' words in Matthew 5-17 best when he says that Jesus came to bring the observance of Torah to its fullness. So what does Jesus mean when he says he did not come to abolish the Torah? Well, let's read Matthew 5 verse 17 through 19. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Amen, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or seraph shall pass away from the Torah, until all things come to pass. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments, and teaches others the same, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, this one shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The Greek word for abolish is kataluo, which shows up twice in verse 17, and when Jesus says, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments, in verse 19, the word the TLV translates as breaks is luo, which can also be translated as abolish. Dr. Matthew Thiessen argues that the use of kataluo in 2 Maccabees, 4 Maccabees, and Josephus should inform how we understand the meaning of kataluo in Matthew 5.17. Jewish context is key, and when you see how these authors use this word, I think you'll see why. So let's start with 4th Maccabees. In chapter 17, the author describes how the Seleucid king Antiochus IV executed a mother and her seven sons because they refused to obey the king's command to eat pork. Antiochus attempted to outlaw Jewish practice to rid his empire of Judaism. And chapter 17 verse 9 says this, here are buried an old priest, an old woman, and seven sons because of the violence of the tyrant who wished to abolish the way of life of the Hebrews. In this verse, abolish, kataluo, refers to Antiochus's attempt to stop Jews from observing the commandments. Josephus says, Antiochus carried away by his ungovernable passions put pressure upon the Jews to abolish their ancestral customs, leaving their infants uncircumcised and sacrificing swine upon the altar. Josephus uses abolish, kataluo, the same way as 4th Maccabees 17 verse 9 does. It refers to Antiochus's vicious attempt to stop Jews from practicing all of Judaism, all Jewish ways of life. The use of kataluo in 2nd Maccabees 2 verse 21 through 22 is also key. 
the author says that Judas Maccabeus and his brothers fought for Judaism in response to Antiochus, who was trying to abolish the commandments. It says, Judas Maccabeus and his brothers fought bravely for Judaism, so that though few in number, they regained possession of the temple, famous throughout the world, and liberated the city and reestablished the laws that were about to be abolished, while the Lord with great kindness became gracious to them. I think Dr. Thiessen is right, that 2nd Maccabees, 4th Maccabees, and Josephus should inform how we understand Jesus' statement in Matthew 5.17. These texts reveal how other Jews during the time of Jesus were using the word abolish, and given this context, and that Jesus' discussion in Matthew 5, verse 17 through 19, is about keeping the commandments, it stands to reason that when Jesus says he did not come to abolish the Torah, He's not talking about undermining the Torah's validity or credibility, as Pastor Andy Stanley suggests. What Jesus is saying is that he has not come to stop Jews from keeping the Torah's commandments. He has not come to abolish Judaism. And right there, in Matthew 5, verse 17, we have Jesus' emphatic statement that he did not come to oppose Judaism. Pastor Stanley's interpretation that Jesus means he came to bring the law to a designated end, as in making it obsolete, cannot be sustained when this text is read in its Jewish context. Because if Jesus made the Torah obsolete, he would be attempting to stop Jewish people from observing the commandments. He would be destroying Judaism, which he said he did not come to do. Jesus would be a complete hypocrite because he practiced Judaism throughout his life. For more on Matthew 5, I made a video responding to Rabbi Tovia Singer's reading of Matthew 5, verse 27 through 28, and I'll link that in the description below. So now to sum up, Jesus did not oppose Judaism, and he was not trying to start a new religion outside of Judaism. This common misconception stems from a failure to understand Jesus in his Second Temple Jewish context. Judaism during the time of Jesus was not monolithic. There was not one form of Judaism. Once we understand this, and that Jesus was a Jew debating how best to interpret and obey the Torah with his fellow Jews, the assumption that Jesus opposed Judaism and tried to start a new religion evaporates. Jesus demonstrates his commitment to observe the Torah through his declaration of the Shema and his emphatic statement that he did not come to abolish the Torah, but as I explained, bring its observance to its fullness. Like other observant Jews, Jesus wears tzitzit, which are intended to serve as a reminder to keep the commandments. Jesus attends synagogue on Shabbat, and when challenged whether it is lawful to heal on this sacred day, he uses persuasive rabbinic halakhic argumentation to show why he is not only justified to heal on Shabbat, but that he should. Even if Jesus' teaching on grace was new, that would not make him any less Jewish. But the fact is that it's not new. Second Temple Jewish sources testify that many Jews held the conviction that salvation comes solely from God, not human achievement. Following the Torah was a faithful response to God's mercy and grace. Jesus did not abandon Torah observance in Jewish tradition. He practiced it, setting the example for his Jewish followers to imitate, and I think for non-Jewish followers of Jesus to appreciate. We are living in in an amazing moment in history. Throughout centuries and still today, many Christians and Jews have thought that Jesus opposed Judaism and came to replace it with his brand new religion of Christianity. However, today, the majority of Jewish and Christian scholars in Jesus' research, to quote Dr. Karen Zetterholm, view Jesus as firmly rooted in Judaism and his message as part of the multifaceted Second Temple Judaism. Allow me to quote just a few scholars from diverse backgrounds on this point. Christian scholar Dr. James Charlesworth of Princeton Theological Seminary says this, By ignoring Judaism, or seeing it only as the background of the Gospels, one arrives at a unique religion called Christianity. But this modern construct provides ammunition for those who want a triumphant, supersessionistic Christianity that is a new religion divorced from Judaism and superseding it. Jesus should not be imagined as the first Christian. He was a devout Jew who observed the Torah. Jewish scholar Dr. Amy Jill Levine of Vanderbilt University says this, 
Jesus and his earliest followers were all Jews. He dressed like a Jew, prayed like a Jew, instructed other Jews on how best to live according to the commandments given by God to Moses, taught like a Jew, and argued like a Jew with other Jews. A non-religious, agnostic scholar, Dr. Bart Ehrman of University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, he says this, Did Jesus plan to start a new religion? Virtually everybody who works on the historical Jesus today, from a critical perspective, will say the answer is no. Jesus was not planning to start a new religion that was separate from Judaism. From my evaluation of the evidence, all these scholars are right. Jesus did not oppose Judaism and replace it with his brand new religion of Christianity. Jesus lived as a Jew and expected his Jewish followers to do the same. If Jesus came to oppose Judaism, he wouldn't recite the Shema, the fundamental expression of Judaism, as the most important commandment. He wouldn't wear tzitzit and tefillin. He wouldn't debate Pharisees with rabbinic arguments on what is lawful on the Sabbath. And he wouldn't say that he has not come to stop Jews from observing the Torah. If Jesus came to oppose Judaism and start a new religion outside of Judaism, he would have said something like what the Christian bishop Ignatius wrote in the early 2nd century. It is monstrous to talk of Jesus Christ and to practice Judaism. Jesus said nothing like this. Instead, he practiced Judaism and expected his Jewish followers to do the same. What this means for Messianic Jews is that we can walk with confidence that our religious expression of Judaism is a faithful expression of our loyalty to Jesus the Messiah. And this does not mean that Christians should abandon Christianity and join the Messianic synagogue. That's not what I'm saying. If you read on in the book of Acts and Paul's letters, you will see that Gentiles who follow Jesus as the Messiah do not have the same responsibility to obey the Jewish specific Torah commandments that Jews have. Just as there is value in Jewish identity in the body of Messiah, there is value in non-Jewish identity because our worshiping together shows that the God of Israel is also the God of the whole world and that we all, Jew and Gentile, are united by our faith in the Messiah. If you want to explore more on that topic, check out our video, The Shema's Impact on the Gospel and Replacement Theology. I'll link that in the description below. Messianic Jews, Messianic Gentiles, and Christians can all get behind the following point made by Dr. David Rudolph. He says, to love Jesus is to love him in the fullness of his divinity and humanity, and being a Jew is fundamental to his humanity. There's so much more to be said, and that's why I encourage you to subscribe to the channel where we examine the Jewish context, not only for understanding Jesus, but also Paul and the rest of the New Testament, all in order to love Jesus and love each other more effectively. So please hit the subscribe button if you're interested in joining this conversation with us. And as always, if you'd like to share your thoughts on anything I said, whether you agree or whether you disagree, put them down in the comments below. Thanks for joining me and see you next time.